All right, it's 7.30, so we'll call the meeting to order. This is the Hopkinton Conservation Commission. It's July 23rd, 2019 at the Hopkinton Senior Center. And uh, Don, we have documents for review. Yes, the two order conditions. One is still, um, we're still working with the uh, applicant just to confirm the amount of um, proposed disturbance. Okay. And then the other one, we're waiting on um, revised site plans. For Spring Street. Correct. Okay. So we figure we'll get you signatures now and we should be able to issue get that them within a week. And you know, yeah, once issued. the plant, yep, yeah, once that's okay. comes in. Okay, the draft minutes for review, June 18th, 2019. Did everyone get a chance to look at those? Any comments? Changes? If I can get a motion to approve the minutes of June 18th, please. I'll make second. the motion. I'll second. All in favor? All right. Aye. Opposed? Okay, thank you. No new applications filed within the past two weeks. Uh, and we have an Eagle Scout Trail project in the work session for Mr. Riddabush, Zero Hayden Row. Come on up. How's it going, Ethan? It's going good. Is Big Brother home for the summer or? Yeah, he's in. All right. How's that going? Uh, it's going pretty good. Okay. He's uh, out right now seeing a movie with friends. But Excellent. All right. So what do you got for us? So I have uh, some documents that are just maps of the area. Um, okay. And then on the back is a, you can see, is a, um, a diagram of the bridge type that uh, has been previously approved by the Conservation Commission. Um, and I guess I was just... Uh, we're asking for it, uh, permission to for, to um, build, I guess, just begin the project. So what's going to be is it's going to be two. There's already an existing multi-use trail uh, off of Hayden Row, which you can see on so the So this map. is the Hughes property. Yeah, Hughes right. property. Context, okay. Yep. And there's already an existing multi-use trail. And uh, mm -hmm. I t I've been talking uh, with Mr. Lagoy, uh, who is a, a representative, and as part of my Eagle project, I was looking to build two smaller trails, which would be uh, about three to four uh, mm -hmm. feet across wide. They'd be very small, and they'd be uh, natural ground covering that would add to the distance and just be uh, supplemental trails. In addition, as part of the project, there are parts of the trails where it crosses uh, streams, and uh, I was asked to, uh, to build some uh, small stream crossing. Uh, and so, uh, because I have other members of my troop, I was able to pull up this diagram. Something that was previously approved by a conservation commission, and that's the diagram you see on the back. Okay. So it's 10 feet long, four foot wide. Yeah. There'd be uh, at one point there, where we're crossing uh, a bit of a stream. There'd be two of those, one after the other. Okay. And then they're just laid on the ground. Yes. Correct? Yeah. They're and slightly they upraised, so. The, yeah, okay, and then you have some spacing in between the planks. Yes. So that light can get through there, okay. And the proposed additions are the two blue sections, correct? Yes, and then on the map below there, the yellow and the purple ones. That one is just a reference for distance. Uh, I checked that with the GPS, so that one is to scale. More to scale than the other ones. So that's going to be called the lollipop loop? Uh, yes. No. Okay. All right, I think this looks pretty straightforward. Questions or comments from the commission? So, yes, Mr. Cirillo. Um, Ethan was at the Trail Coordination Management Committee meeting last week. And um, at the time, he had a slightly, sim uh, slightly different trail map, but I pointed mm -hmm. out that, that, and even now as it's drawn, uh, the proposed trail uh, goes on to two properties under uh, our control, Concoms, that one there, mm -hmm. which is R, parcel R32A, and then the bottom one uh, known as the South Barn parcel, which is on his map actually. So I brought that up to them uh, at our meeting, and I think it's something that we ought to consider and make sure that's okay with us. Okay. What is the clearing involved? Just like brush, you know, uh, cutting yeah. trees down? Um, 
there will be no large trees cut down and anything that will take a, like a saw or a few men with axes to get through is not going to be cleared. It's mostly going to be uh, small saplings and foliage that would get in the way of one person walking through. So it's going to be it's going to be fairly simple. Uh, there might be some clearage of leaves as far as raking, but just enough that you can see the ground and where you're supposed to travel. Okay. Uh, so we don't have any people wandering off the trail. Uh, would definitely not be major. Not uh, no gravel cover or anything. And then how wide? Uh, about three to four feet, uh, just enough for <coughs> one person to walk. Okay. All right. I think that seems okay to me. And then the other question is, where where is the crossing? Where can you point out where where the um, crossing? Um. Is? So that's uh, if this on is the map. Typical, but yeah. Uh. So you see on the on the map where there's the main trail. Uh, that's going to be on the main trail. It's going to be just slightly past the uh, the end of the uh, loop trail. There. Yeah, the end of the second trail. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's a bouldery area, if I yeah. remember correctly. Correct. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. As All right. A, as a representative for open space, which the selectmen are trying to give this land back to open space. Um, I think it would behoove you to come to an open space meeting and talk about it too. Okay, what nights do you guys meet? That's a good question. Usually, <laughs> it's once a month on the first Tuesday. Okay. Um, first Thursday. However. Pardon? First it's Thursday. First Thursday, yes. Okay. <laughs> Which was the 4th of July. So, I'm not sure because we've got a schedule sort of is muddy at the moment, Don. Do you know when our next scheduled meeting is for? Yeah, it'll be the First Thursday in August. I don't know the date off the top Next of my head. About two weeks from now. The first? First Thursday. Two weeks from this Thursday. Okay. I'm actually going to be out of town until August 5th is uh, is my problem with that, I guess. When? when so you could come to the first in September. Okay. I was looking to begin well, this project as quickly as possible, yeah, right? Cause so how close are the Board of Select to, as you say, giving it back to you? I have no idea, and I don't know I'm how not close. A complicated process, yeah, and I don't know how close we are to taking it. So well, maybe you can once. maybe Ed, um, you can discuss it at the meeting, and if there's any issues, um, yeah. and we have the maps here, so you can take a couple of these with you. Yeah, yeah certainly. Just let them know what's going yeah. on. I mean, they don't have ownership of the property, you know, custody of the property now, but what's just your, to give what's them the heads up. Uh, Ethan uh, at symbol uh, Ritterbush. Web, all one word. Uh, our, my last name is spelled R I T T. Yeah, yeah. But I, I got Ethan at Ritterbush. And, yeah, Ritterbush. And I'll yeah. forward you his uh, email. Ah, oh, okay. He gave okay. it to it. He gave it to us on a request. Oh, or it's even better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. The, the other request I had um, is. Yep. Uh, just hold on one second, okay, and then I'll um, open it up for comments is that there's a um, dog station that needed to be installed like in the parking lot area. So there was talk about that. A pardon? A dog station? What you know, like that? the doggy, you know, I the, think that the got, poop station? I, I think that got canceled, right? Or was it? I don't know. Um, Jim, did you? I have nothing to do with it, except that I'm, I'm promoting paper bags for a dog pickup instead of plastic bags. Okay. Um, but anyways, let us just, um, connect the dots as far as that goes okay. and if it's something that um, the different committees that have jurisdiction over this amenable to would you consider including that in the scope of the project it'd be just basically digging a hole putting the post in and yeah sure and putting some rocks around it and backfilling it so yeah, it's I pretty straightforward I could make that point. okay who's going to take that out of there I mean when it was once going to be a dog park it was DPW I think yeah, who's this doesn't have anything to do with the dog park. It's just similar no, to the center who picks, trail. Who's gonna, who collects the? Uh, Mike Bolson. Or is it take it, bring it? Shouldn't it be a carry in, carry out kind of thing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You go to a state park, you gotta bring everything out. You bring it in. Why don't you? Yeah, so we can just modify the station so the waste pail isn't there. You can just get the bag. Okay. Which is usually the issue. You yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay. Maybe yeah. a sign. Uh, but anyways, let's. Uh, so is I don't that want to item I'm going to have to take action on, or are you guys going to? Yeah, I'll take the lead so. on it, and okay. then um, depending on what happens, I'll let you know either way. Um, it sounds okay. like it may be just something that is going to take too long to get approved, um, get it buy-in from everyone. So, uh -huh. 
that may be the next Eagle Scout project, okay. part of it. But uh, I'll let you know. Uh -huh. Okay, questions or comments from the audience? Uh, just one small comment. I would just like to uh, uh, request that the map be drawn um, a little more accurately. Okay. To show, um, because the way the maps are shown, it really shows that it doesn't cross. Like if you go to that next one, the, with the picture that you had too, there's one more that you've shown. This is the first one. There's the one that he handed out. This is the first one we got, and then right. then this came that later. Crosses onto the other property, but in fact, it goes much further than that into that property. Are you talking about the, the, the Are you talking about the multi east trail, the main one? No, I'm talking about that. Uh, yeah. Loop trail oh, okay. This yeah. one shows it going further in. Right, but it's even further than that because where that big rock is, that's between my house and the house next door to mine. Um, so it's to the southern part of that property line. Um, which, if you if you see on that one, underneath where it says that US 25 or whatever that is right there, that property line, a little south of the pointer right there, yep, right there, no further, right there. It goes past that point. The blue so line, yes, the there. yeah, into that area. So if you could just coordinate so that. Just yeah. Around the record, as it yeah, this is, I was, I was, this is actually the same map. I was combining it with the black and white map we saw in the previous email. I was just overlaying it. Oh. That's like, the way I created this was I overlaid it and changed the colors of, a, uh, of the map available on the, on the town website. So it's, that one and that one was not created with GPS, so it's not entirely accurate, but I can definitely <coughs> look into getting a more accurate map for you. Sure. Yep, and then what's your name and address? Doug Nixon, 11 Black so, Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, there's like at least three maps. Um, right, one, two, and then there's the third right. one. There's the third one. Yeah. They don't exactly match with each other. Which one is going to be, if we know, which one is going to be the trail? The blue one, I think what Ethan said, is the one with the blue lines that he brought in. That's uh yeah. So if you if you scroll up on this page, John, that is the one with the blue lines and the gray lines is on the top of the paper I handed out. That is this map, overlaid and then the colors changed on top of the t the map available on the town uh, website. And you walked that with um, and plotted it and walked it with GPS and or no. And then and then the map below that where you see the colors. Yeah. That's the GPS map, but it's oh, not. Okay. So but that's, that's not overlapped on the town map, so you can't see the boundaries of all the properties. Which no, I, but you can see on that that the that the yellow, the yellow line, the yellow trail does go more southerly than the one up at the, above because you can see what the right, one yeah. is. Right. Yeah. So if you can just overlay the GPS coordinates onto the map for the town. Okay. Yeah. With the and property. make sure it's accurate. Yeah. Okay. Um, then we'll submit that for the record. Okay. Sure. Right. Um, but again, Mr. Chairman, this, so that's property under our control. Right. Yep. Um, a trail, you know, coming from Hughes, which is now under, I guess, Board of Selectmen's control, maybe open space again. Uh, we're okay with that, you know, going on the, on the land managed by CONCOM, right? I'm fine with it. I'll open okay. it up to the other commission members. I don't see an issue with it. Fine. It's just a matter of maintaining it, managing it, maintaining it, I guess. Thinking of the, the new coordination committee. So if open space is to maintain the hues, they would also have to maintain this. This is my point. Okay. Questions or comments from the audience? Okay, so Mr. Lagoy is working with you on this? Yes. Okay. Uh, we Just be careful, that guy is a little shady. <laughs> in the audience, yeah. Well, there he is, I'm Mr. Lagoy. <laughs> All right, I think we're good. Thank All you, right. Ethan. Yep, good luck with it. Thank you. Okay, 745 Borrego Solar, Zero Wood Street. This is a notice of intent for a solar facility. The Hopkinton Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, July 23rd, 2019 at 730 at the Hopkinton Senior Center. 28 Mayhew Street to hear all persons interested in a notice of intent filed by Borrego Solar Systems for the installation of a ground mounted solar facility with associated site work. The location is 0 Wood Street, Assessor's Map U6, Block 21, Lot 0.
Good evening. Good evening. Thanks Good for evening. having us in this evening. My name is Matt Swansburg. I'm the project developer for this project. I've been working with the Larder family on developing this uh, project on their property. With me today is Brandon Smith. He is my civil engineer. He is the brains behind this operation and we'll tell you guys um, today a little bit about what we're planning on a high level and I believe that we've also received a peer review um, already which is great and we appreciate the Conservation Commission's um, uh, effort in kind of helping us out and getting this reviewed ahead of our first meeting so thank you for that sure um, but again uh, this is to discuss a ground mounted solar array on the larder property off of uh, Wood Street and uh, Brandon will give you a high level um, overview of the project and then we can open that up to any comments um, that you have Great. Very good. Thanks, Matt. Yep. So again, yeah, Brandon Smith, civil engineer with Borrego Solar. So the project uh, in question here is located north of Wood Street. So if you imagine Wood Street's kind of down here, this is 495 on the eastern portion of it. Uh, to the west, it's along Whitehall Brook. So that's kind of how it's bordered. Uh, as if you're familiar with other solar projects, uh, very similar to other sites have been built in town. It's basically modules mounted on galvanized steel racking um, with augered foundations. Uh, this site in particular is broken up into three separate arrays, kind of the eastern array, western array, and the northern array. Uh, we have basically placed these arrays around some delineated wetlands uh, that were delineated for us by Prime Engineering. Uh, there are wetlands, as you can see, kind of associated with Whitehall Brook along the west. Uh, there is this one to the south east, um, and kind of stretching around. So we've, we've placed the array to avoid any uh, impacts to the wetlands directly, but there are some buffer impacts that, that we're proposing. Uh, the western array, so the current site conditions are basically there's uh, sand and gravel operation along the western array. There are green ho houses, kind of hoop houses along this northern array. So these two are basically replacing those, those uses with no tree clearing proposed um, for those other than a small area for the, east, uh, for the western array. The eastern array though, there is some tree clearing, um, some tree clearing in this wetland buffer. Uh, I think the main item we, or one of the main items we we'd like to discuss or get the commission's feedback on is we, did, we are proposing some of these panels to be within the 200 foot riverfront area as well as this wetland buffer. As you can see, just to kind of give you an idea of the reason that we are proposing that is because the current site conditions <coughs> kind of are like this. This is the sand and gravel operation. Obviously you can see there's no topsoil, no vegetation of any kind active site. Uh, we are proposing to uh, restore the soil, till it, you know, loosen it, get rid of some of the compaction that's been done over the years, uh, add topsoil and reseed it to result in something closer to this. These are some of our uh, projects that we've built across the state. You know, there's uh, a couple of New York projects represented here. There's a Newberry Mass, Lancaster Mass project. So that's kind of what we're looking to do with some of these riverfront areas and wetland buffers um, that we are encroaching on or that we're proposing to put the, the system within. Um, that, those are the main items, kind of the main items. We did get DEP comments back as well, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, we haven't had a chance to respond to those yet. We got them, I think, yesterday. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'd like and to answer any questions. Yep, yeah, and then we have beta uh, doing a peer review as well, Don. I don't think we've... Um, um. Yeah, beta's doing a review for the... For the water. Uh, the, yeah, for the, well, they've also been engaged for the uh, site plan review because yes. we've submitted right, to the, right. the plan. So the stormwater re, uh, yeah. peer review is uh, um, some of that. Get the know. initial, yeah, back on July 3rd. Okay. And Beta yeah. was also the peer reviewer for the planning board. We've been to right. our first planning board meeting already. Uh, the planning board did visit the site last weekend. 
mm -hmm. on Saturday morning. Um, and I know Beta is now involved in uh, reviewing this for the Conservation Commission as well. Right, okay. Can you just put that plan on the table yeah, here, please? So I can take a look at it. Okay. So what portion of this is currently undisturbed? This is the gravel operation over here? Yep. Okay. So this, this is where the hoop houses are? Correct. So really, the, this our fence line for this northern area is right along the, we've kind of specifically placed it along the edge of that disturbed area. So that's kind of the disturbed area. There is a road here also. Uh, you know, these roads would be considered disturbance as well. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the other areas, this is disturbed, but, you know, we're not going to be putting any rays there. The rest of it, it's basically, there's some here, and then this all is kind of, like, basically represented by that photo that I showed on the other sheet. Okay. So this is currently undisturbed? Correct. correct. Up, up to... Yeah, um, road up there? it might help. I have a tree clearing plan, and basically... Sheet going to? Oh, tr the tree clearing plan is on sheet two C two point out. So you can see there's, you know, this is where that array is being placed, and so most of that eastern array is is undisturbed, except for this. So majority. Hmm. Yeah, as far as the buffers. Go. We, you know, we did stay out of the no disturbed. Um, really, the only area that we're encroaching on the no disturbed is, is here where we're where it's already disturbed. Um, right. Okay. So just to give you a little bit of uh, background, mm -hmm. you know, this I think is going to be the fourth utility scale project that's coming through the permitting process mm -hmm. with us, um, and. Uh, one of the sites had areas where there was disturbance. It was a former nursery project. Yeah. The other two were in areas that were wooded and then cleared. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the two arrays where the property was cleared um, of the existing upland area, we required everything to be outside the 100 foot buffer zone. Okay. Uh, 100 uh, sorry 100 foot buffer for the wetlands or, or riverfront for the wetlands wetlands okay. yeah um for the arrays okay. for for the riverfront there's area that's the former gravel area correct yes okay so i think we can um if you guys are going to be doing mitigation in that area of the former gr gravel operation um, I think we can work with you um, in areas where there's disturbance. Um, you know, I think that we would still, and I'll open this up to the other commission members, um, you know, we would still like to see those arrays pulled out of the riverfront area and the buffer zones as much as possible, but again, we can work with you because of the mitigation that you guys are doing at the property. Right. Um, but as far as areas where there's tree clearing um, and upland that's being disturbed um, for the for the proposed work, you know everything um, is required to be outside of the 100 foot buffer zone. Okay, so right. that would be basically this area is really the main area we're talking about, and I guess this this small area here. Does that include tree clearing and trimming? or just the placement of the uh, physical solar panels? So the tree clearing, it includes, um, but we would allow trimming. So for shading purposes, there's also there's our limit of work, and that sometimes includes tree clearing, trimming, and then obviously the solar array itself. Mm -hmm. um, but we usually will have our solar panels stop at a certain point and there might be 25, 50 or feet after that where we do some tree clearing and trimming selective to mitigate shading on the solar panels. Right. Right. So like, for example, we pull the, 
the array outside so there'd be no construction or no structures inside the 100 foot and then basically from the 100 foot to this tree line would be some sort of selective clearing whether it's you know only trees over 25 foot taken or some something that can kind of retain that ground cover and that soil stability while still reducing the shading on the system right. I don't know if that would be we've had other conservation commissions recommend that um, if we are to clear any trees or trim trees we if it's within the hundred foot buffer we leave stumps um, anything like that to help mitigate um, any it's disturbance erosion. actually the soils erosion from the soils yeah. but for the most part when we ask as developers for tree clearing and trimming um, it's not so much for the purpose of expanding the solar array the physical array it's to prevent shading on the solar panels so that we can produce electricity right yep. yeah and that, yeah and, it, and outside of the fence kind of regardless we would re keep those stumps for the purposes we just mentioned yeah um, I mean I think we would allow trimming of the trees but not the actual removal um, what what size system what's the three megawatts or what uh, this current so cur currently this is five megawatt system um, has four megawatts of AC it does have an energy storage um, component as well okay okay questions comments from the Commission can I ask um, what's the topography like in that area that you're yeah, so it's, so it's kind of uh, these two areas, the disturbed areas, are very flat. Mm -hmm. um, this is more um, kind of undulating. There are some, some steep sections here. This is flatter. Um, this, where we kind of stop the array and get the contours in the front. Yeah, yeah, this sheet might be the best one to see. C4.0 has the contours if you didn't want to show it. You can see there's kind of a knoll here. That's kind of where we stop to stay away from any of this steeper area. Um, this is generally flat. There are some kind of isolated steep sections here and like here. Um, this is mostly just hilly. There, we will need to do some grading for like these sections here to knock down some of the high points. The the racking that we use can can handle quite a bit of terrain, so we it you can limit. Yeah, yeah, we can limit a lot of the grading because it because the racking can take care of it. But there are some areas on this site that we will need to, you know, smooth out. But the majority of it will remain as is once we remove the trees. Where is the uh, battery storage going to be located? That's right, right there. Yeah, okay. here. So outside of. The buffer areas. And then what block did you guys get this into? You guys know a lot about solar. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are not in a block position yet. In order to qualify for the Massachusetts Solar Program, we need to have all of our non-ministerial permits, which in this case includes having an order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. So this is one of the pieces that we need to qualify the project. Hmm. Okay. Okay, questions, comments from the commission? Yeah, I guess I would just make what um, may be a recurring comment. Any trees, if this were, if somebody were proposing a, a, a new uh, single family residence and they wanted to take down trees uh, in the resource area, we would likely have a lot of discussion and may not allow them to do that. If the only reason they're doing it is because they're too close to the house or they're not in danger of the house. So I feel the same way with this. If we if we uh, if we require people to allow keep trees as they are naturally, maybe with some pruning um, that are within um, striking distance of their house, then we should keep these trees. Well, we should be require that these trees remain, stay out of the hundred foot, except for limbing, uh, you know, dangerous limbs, but not pollarding or not. Uh, everything anything over 25 feet or whatever it is that you suggested it's a lot of trees right 
There's already eight and a half acres of trees being cut down to put this in. As, as, as the resident tree hugger, there's 65 acres of trees being lost in New England every day. So I have a lot of, I mean, the high deer of solar energy, I think is, I'm all for that, but this trade, I have real difficulty with. Mm. One question that I, I do have, and, and um, this will help us out too with our planning purposes, uh, you had mentioned that if it was a residential development, there would be some tree clearing, obviously, so that trees don't fall in a house. Minimal. Right? Really a minimal tree clearing. Um, so one thing that I would add to, um, to this discussion is that in addition to clearing or tr uh, trimming trees for the purpose of production, we also clear and trim trees so that they don't fall on the solar asset themselves, so that they don't sol fall on the solar panels. So we do have to clear trees from the perimeter of our solar system in case that trees do fall on the solar panels, which is obviously, as you can imagine, very costly. Alternatively, you can set the panels back far enough so they're not within striking distance of natural to have existing trees. And there's a balance that we have to sort of take here with system size and also the cost of um, interconnecting the project to the utility. Um, this is a project that is well suited, I think, uh, for the town in terms of location. But with that also comes additional cost of interconnecting the project. Our main point of interconnection is down on Main Street, uh, which is how many feet away? About 2,000. About 2,000 feet away. So because we've chosen this location, which I think is a good location for a solar project, it also carries that cost of bringing three phase from the main street to this location. So we have to contend with that cost and maintaining a certain system size to be able to pay for the interconnection costs. So we try to make that balance as best as we can. Well, Mr. Chairman, I understand that, but we generally don't take the business economics into account when it comes to our charge under the uh, bylaw and the state act. I concur with that. And just, um, you know, when we went through the permitting process on these other arrays that we had in town, we heard, you know, very similar things at the get go with, um, with the other folks, you know, well, if we pull it back, you know, beyond the 100 foot buffer, it's not cost efficient, not cost effective, the project's not viable, um, but somehow they were able to uh, make that work. You know, I know you're under a different program now in terms of the um, SMART and not the SREC, but you know, I would just say sharpen your pencils and um, you know, uh, see what you can do. And uh, um, you know, as I said, we can work with you on certain areas of the project with this mitigation. You know, we certainly take that into account if you guys are restoring area, particularly riverfront area, um, an area within the 50 foot buffer zone. Um, you know, we can, uh, we factor that into our decision making process. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. And I know that, you know, Matt had quite a few comments um, that, uh, Lucas had, you got the comments from the DEP, we have Beta's comments, we still have, uh, you know, we still have some work to do here. Yep. Uh, Matt, is there anything specifically that you wanted to point out at this point? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the big thing that probably needs to get nailed down, you know, before you guys address some of the other things is really nailing down the wetland boundaries. So around where the hoop house areas are, um, had some issues just reviewing the flags, the flags that were in place or were not in place. Um, and as you know, that area is so disturbed that it's kind of a, a tricky area to look at from a wellness perspective anyways. So um, that needs to be nailed down so that we understand where the BVW is. Uh, a lot of that area is in 100-year floodplain, so it qualifies as bordering land subject to flooding. So you do, in addition to the work within riverfront area, you are proposing work in bordering land subject to flooding, it appears. Yeah. So all those um, impacts need to be calculated to and taken into account as far as any needs for potential mitigation or if, you know, grading is going to change in there. 
because um, I think there's a question of whether the hoop houses were ever permitted or not, and whether they were there may have been loss of floodplain when those were built, and there may be an opportunity to do restoration of potentially some unauthorized work in there that may be to your benefit. I don't know. Um, and then some of the other wetland areas, I think, were actually flagged overly conservatively in my opinion mm -hmm. so some of the wetlands may actually shrink in size that again may be to your benefit where some of these buffer zones may move back um so i think i think kind of nailing down exactly what all the existing conditions are is going to be important to get that right off the bat so you know where really what your limitations are so that when the commission is saying no panels within the 104 buffer zone and minimizing within the riverfront area and understanding what's in floodplain you guys kind of know what your playing field is totally. um, so that hopefully, you know, it can it can be made to work to the commission's satisfaction. So I think that's really, to me, that should be sort of job one. And then, um, you know, a lot of the other comments that I had made will sort of come in behind that. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I, I read through your comments. Uh, so I think, like, like you mentioned, we'll re-engage uh, Prime Engineering. We did our wetland delineation to, to kind of revisit some of these and that might you know that might change some of what we're proposing here as i know this based on your observations it looks like this is actually an isolated wetland um right. so we'll we will have them get back out there reflag and basically look at your recommendations yeah. on that the, the other i guess those. big question i had that i had i don't know that i commented okay. so in the center of that you're you're clearly leaving sort of the the bullseye here there yep. with no development there why is that that area is for the larder family to have um, for whatever use they don't have any future at this point development plans on this property or any of the abutting properties uh, but they have requested that for their purposes uh, we leave this area open okay. and our critical path for this project is to take your recommendation and to get prime engineering, um, our wetland consultant to come out there and kind of rework or tweak the wetland lines according to, to Mark's comments. Yeah, Matt, and, and to this point, you know, I, I think there were some areas um, that were conservatively or over conservatively um, flagged, so. And that's kind of where that give and take is. We prefer to be overly conservative at first and then work with the commission so that if there is a way to maintain that system size that we feel like we need in order for the, the project to pencil, maybe there are areas where we were too conservative and we can increase the footprint in a few areas while coming out of a buffer somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so I think... Yeah. Impact those more valuable resources exactly. less and maybe impact some of the less valuable more to, to make up some of that loss. Okay. Um, All right. Questions or comments from the... Oh, oh sorry, Carrie. Um, can you explain a little more the because I saw both the comments DP about the um, where the hundred year floodplain is and the impacts? Yeah, so this it's kind of hard to see. This dashed red line is the one hundred year flood elevation. So it's basically really it's, it affects the north array. Uh, so the flood elevation in this area is a foot and a half um, in some of these areas for the hundred year. Um, our racking, there's no electrical equipment here. Our racking's all up on galvanized legs, so it's very little impact. I'll, I'll make sure we get those calculations done because there will be, we are proposing topsoil, so there'll be some volume there. Um, but that's, that's kind of the, the impact that we're referring to. And my second question is they also mentioned like a, a culvert under the existing road. That's down here. So this exists, so the access to the site is, this is all existing. Um, really the only additional road that we'd be constructing is just this turnaround near the equipment area. So this is existing with an existing culvert under this kind of intermittent stream feeding to Whitehall Brook. So that's... So I think there was a here. question, does that currently meet the stream crossing standards? Matt, there's no way it does. No. <laughs> <Definitely not>. It's <laughs> pretty old, yeah. Yeah, so we, yeah we weren't pr proposing to... This, this road is in really good condition, so we weren't proposing any work on the culvert of the road. And just for the public and the commission's um, benefit, there is currently, um, if anyone doesn't know, a cell phone tower 
right there on the property. Mm -hmm. um, and so the cell phone tower company um, uses this access here to get to their system. And similar to what we're proposing, bringing in power from the main road 2,000 feet away, they are also bringing in power up this existing road to their cell phone tower. How are they going to get to it? So oh, the, I see. The, okay. That's why we're leaving this uh, this open. And there is, you know, we are proposing trenching here um, within the within the roadway. So, I have one more question, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. um, so, in downstream properties, there's issues with like flooding and beavers. Has there been anything like that existing? Not to my knowledge, mm -hmm. and um, I did ask the, the Larder family about flooding in this particular area where we're in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. um, and John Larder, who's owned the property for quite some time, doesn't recall this area ever being flooded. Um, so I, I can't speak to. No, that was yeah. the answer. Questions or comments from the audience? All right, guys. Well, thank you. Um, still some work to do. Yep. Yeah, so we'll, yeah. just What's to kind of... What's the date looking for? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have August 6th, August 20th, and September 10th. Those are the next three meetings. August 6th would be... I, we do have a lot of work, but I... It's up to you. What's August 6th? <laughs> What's today? So, what's the August deadline for two weeks. resubmittal of plans ahead of the meeting? Is you like to get them like a week before? Just to give so you would want guys. something on the thirtieth from us for the six. Yeah, for the, for the six. six. Just to give Matt time to go through what it. The next one after that. Yeah, yeah that's probably. So what's the next one after that? The twentieth. We should do the twentieth. Yep. Yeah, the twentieth would would be great if we could get on that agenda. Okay. No, so just to kind of yeah. recap our action items, we'll, we'll respond to the comments, move this, we'll work on moving this fence uh, or this you know, array outside of the 100 foot and uh, based on prime revisit to the site, kind of look at some of these buffers uh, or some of the wetland delineations, see if they're, they're going to move. Um, it's going that way. So let us know if we could get a little bit more detail into what the mitigation um, will involve. I think that'd be helpful for the commission. Yep. Um, just so we can weigh that with, uh, you know, incursions beyond the 50 foot or the 100 foot buffer. Excuse me. Yeah, and I think if I can add to that, Jeff, um, both with the border lines of the flooding and the road front area, where you're actively working within those resource areas. You know, a, a thorough performance standard analysis, especially with the riverfront area, where you sort of have two different categories: redevelopment or new development within riverfront area. Really breaking that down because they have much different performance standards as right. far as what you have to get to, um, and sort of breaking that up both quantifiably um, and qualifiably, so that you can show that you know that you're meeting those standards, because especially with the redevelopment one. Uh, right. As you know, the, the standard is you have to show a Im net improvement of the riverfront area of when you're done from what you started. Um, and that's obviously in the eye of the commission to decide. So um, really showing how you're meeting that standard, I think it's going to be important for the commission to make their decision. Okay, great. All right. All right. Thank well, you, gentlemen. I appreciate the feedback. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you. you. Appreciate it. Oh, yes. With you on some uh, NOI information that you're still waiting on? Yeah, let me um, actually have the hard copies of what I sent you. Okay, good. Um, as well as our green card. We can just look at the green cards. You just need to present them, but they're your yeah, property. That's you what you said in the affidavit. Cards. Yeah, so. And those are the <laughs> three, three <laughs> copies of the hard <laughs> copies uh, that I sent you. Thank uh, you. The earlier this week. And I'll get you. So they were uh, signed by the applicant and the owner? Which um, one of these? So this is what I get the, when I go to the assessment. This, these so were signed the by me letters. as the applicant. So gonna, we, we can the submit to the, the, the we, we have a notice from the owner basically Good. giving us permission to act on the gap. So I'll make sure yep. I, I provide that to you as well. Yeah, we should have that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Okay, REC Hopkinton 0 South Street. This is an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation, which is a continuation. Good, Good evening. Good, how are you? From Goddard Consulting, here representing Hopkinton REC. These are hot off the presses, so apologies. Thank you. I haven't had the time to look at them, but basically, we are presenting that no change since last time we were here. Um, so just a brief overview of the history of the project. Uh, this NRAD has been going on since last November. Um, there was a, some discussion over the uh, BVW line, um, which we had given concessions on um, across the board, uh, and I believe we're all in agreement that we're, those are accurate. Uh, this spring, we asked for a time to reevaluate a potential IVW on site, which we now are also in agreement is IVW, mm -hmm. um, and that is also shown on the plans. Um, at the last hearing, my colleague Mark Arnold uh, attended on my behalf, um, and there was some discussion over the certification or status of potential vernal pools uh, in the uh, section of the wetland. Um, we have since provided uh, additional uh, surveys of the area, um, two in June on the 7th and the 10th, um, which resulted in no egg masses being found given how late it was in the year. Um, there was a potential that um, any obligate species would already be hatched out, so we also conducted dip netting on both of those occasions um, in a 10 by 10 grid pattern. We kind of tried to, as best you can, it's pretty uh, deep out there. Um, but those resulted in no amphibian uh, uh, larvae of any kind, which was very surprising at the time of year. Um, given those findings, I went back out on uh, the 17th of July, again did dip netting and uh, inspection of the site for any egg masses. Um, we did find a number of green frog larvae within the um, ponded areas on the site, um, in addition to uh, predaceous diving beetle uh, larvae as well as adults, uh, fingernail clams, um, and a whole host of other uh, species which you list on your local bylaws definition of uh, vernal pool species. Um, however, we still maintain that it is not a vernal pool, even under the bylaws. We have a clear connection to an outflow um, out of the wetland, um, and I think that we therefore don't meet the definitions of a defined basin depression, which is outlined very well in pretty much every standard you have under the bylaw. So there's a this area is basically ponded up to and has been since I've looked at it um, nearly up to the wetland flags. Um, and has a clear connection to the stream which runs almost along the property line and then drains out of uh, underneath South Street through a culvert at the bottom of the system. Okay, so how many separate occasions did you go out and do the dip netting so, to? Uh, three with dip netting and then we had the previous assessment which, May. Uh, yeah, it was in May sometime. May 13th. Yes. Uh, oh, no. Uh, no. May 22nd. Okay. Or, sorry, April 22nd. Yes. April 22nd. Okay. So, um, I guess, you know, the concern was that the commission brought up at the last meeting was the timing of these studies that you did mm -hmm. you know, related to a vernal pool because ideally you want those studies to take place you know March and April mm -hmm. um, when the uh, evidence of the vernal pools you know related to the egg masses and the critters is more evident than it is when you're doing the studies in June and July, mm -hmm. and I think the uh, um, uh, so you know I'll defer to Matt 
um, I guess, on whether you feel that, you know, these dip netting studies that were conducted are going to be appropriate to definitively identify it as, you know, not being a vernal pool. Um, um, yeah, so the, the difficulty in this is always trying to prove a negative because you can go out in any given year in an area and you might not find anything and then you might go back you might not you might not find anything for three or four years and then go back to fifth year and in the right conditions you find things breeding so vernal pool studies are always somewhat hit or miss um, certainly the timing of the studies on this were not ideal I think probably you agree with that yeah certainly um, so so sort of coming to the bottom line of well is it or isn't it um, based on the information that you found of finding the, the we have breeding green frogs in the air and we have sounds like quite an abundance of invertebrate life that's breeding including predaceous diving beetles fingernail clams that are considered sort of facultative vernal pool species um, what it comes down to in my mind in reading the the bylaw guidance on whether or not it's a vernal pool is that you have one criteria um, well, let's read it quickly is you know existing of one a confined basin depression which two contains standing water that dries up during the year or for which other reasons is free of adult fish populations and three the presence of two or more of following in standing water and in that there's a quite a long list there it includes green frogs and predaceous diving beetles as well as every turtle in the, in the state yeah <laughs> um, so I think to a certain degree it comes down to the Commission's interpretation of what a confined basin depression is um, the language in the bylaw doesn't say a confined basin depression with no inlet or outlet uh, just says a confined basin depression uh, I guess my question Tom to you would be in the dip nating you did did you come across any fish within these areas I did not no. okay so the fact and again just because you didn't find any fish in the dip nets doesn't mean they aren't there but I would also say that the dip nets we're using to catch small invertebrates aren't exactly ideal for catching fish, and also under the bylaw, it states adult fish. Uh, right. So again, it, doing this type of study, you know, when you're if you're looking to disprove, you can put out things like fish traps, um, so that you can, if there are fish there, hopefully, you know, something like that, you might have a better chance of finding them than just dip netting, which mm -hmm. is always uh, not a high chance of of getting fish. So. Um, the fact that there weren't any fish found, but they were basically the criteria for it to be a vernal pool, um, I think in my opinion, it still meets the criteria under your bylaw for a vernal pool. Is it one that's ex of extremely high quality? It's hard to say, again, based on the time of year that stuff was done, um, but that would be my opinion. Okay, thank you. So, I think where we're at with this, and I'll open it up to the commission in a second, is, I mean, I think it would make sense to, you know, identify it as, as a presumptive vernal pool, and then, you know, next year, next spring, um, we can do a follow-up study at the appropriate times, and then based on that, you know, we can make the determination of if, it is or if it isn't a vernal pool. Hmm. That's kind of my sense. Uh, but let me open it up to the other commission members and get their opinion as well. If I may offer a potential alternative, would sure. be to yeah. conduct a, an additional survey to see if we can find any fish. Because really at this point, that's one of the, the only criteria under the bylaw that's separating this. Um, Certainly, yeah. I, I'd be uh, amenable to that. That's the we do have fish traps. Um. Okay. And I guess I would I would like to hear the opinion uh, the opinions of the commission on what uh, defines your or your definition of a confined depression or a confined basin depression, whether that can have an outflow which has been shown to flow at every single visit this year, continually flowing. Um. I mean, in my view, it, it could. Um, I 
mean, I'm not a uh, you know, professional wetland scientist, but it seems to me that it could qualify as a vernal pool and still have an inlet and an outlet. Uh, it doesn't necessarily yeah. flow all the time, but you know, once it gets to a certain elevation, mm -hmm. you know, it overtops the elevation, has an outflow. Um, so I think what really the criteria that you know I'm stuck on is is the fish. So I think you know my sense is if you do this fish study and it comes up negative, then I, I would tend to agree with you that um, you know it wouldn't be classified as a vernal pool. I think I'd agree with that. I wouldn't necessarily just because it has an outlet exclude it from being a vernal pool. And if I can go back to the days of old when we had a vernal pool behind a house, it certainly, when it got to a certain height, overflowed into Whitehall. Well, I guess under state definitions, it cannot have a permanently flowing outlet. And my, I guess my opinion on the fact is that it's been permanently flowing. So at this point, and I understand that that's under state regs and not the bylaw, which is what's under review. So beyond that, is this a you know, is it is there a clear basin there geographically and separated from some other Don, you know, uplands or otherwise that are Google Maps image or clearly or not connected to that basin? I mean, is it is there a defined? I mean, behind your house, it's a kettle hall that's pretty well defined. So that's not There's some pictures in the back so, there. Yeah, I saw that. Very I mean, large flooded view. Inundated me. Yeah. Yeah, I would say it's not sort of your quintessential kettle hole so vernal it, pool. It's, you know, it's a, just out there in the middle of an upland. It's flood it's a flooded BVW for sure. Is it uh, fed by this this outfall? Uh, going the other way. So that's emptying it. Oh, uh, it's draining? Yep. It's draining this area? In this particular area? Uh, the whole area. You want your pictures or? It's coming from, it's picking up area from 495, so as part of the submittal of the last uh, oh, I know hearing, I had done a, um, kind of a drainage map um, of the area, so it's picking up a good portion of uh, area beyond 495, and that's yeah. all coming down, just based on topography. Yeah. Is that your uh, main, main response? Uh, yes. I think the other thing to keep in mind that um, I think actually Mr. Goddard had brought up when, when he had presented on this project at one point um, was the fact going back to last September we've had very unusually high mm. rainfall amounts that lasted certainly through the spring. Yep. I think it started to normalize a little bit through the summer now, but um, so it's not surprising that there might be potentially higher flows than might what might normally be out there. Right. That makes sense. Is there any beaver activity? Oh, yeah. So, on that last page, there's actually beavers starting to uh, work on culvert. that culvert. It's pretty fresh um, right. and not very large, but maybe something to bring up to DPW <laughs> and end up with a problem. Oh, is that it, it's at a. Uh, it's right at the culvert on South Street. Oh, good. I'll yeah. let them know that. <laughs> okay. So, I, I just one other comment, yeah. uh, if I could. Um, I guess for the applicant's benefit, I think having some parameters on what your expectations are for, you know, the fish study or, you know, if one unidentified minnow is found in there, is that enough or are you looking for, you know, what, what sort of level, what, what's going to be the threshold of saying, okay, that's enough of a fish population where you feel, um, you know, that it's definitely not a vernal pool. Legal striped bass. <laughs> 28 inches. Good, good, good luck with that. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, if you find one minnow, um, I think that could be an anomaly. You know, I would say if there's evidence of fish population, I mean, I don't know how you quantify or, you know, categorize what a fish population is. Um, you know, if you're catching, you know, more than 10 or 5, I guess. I mean, I, I don't know, Matt, what would you recommend? Yeah, this? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fish biologist, but I, I, I guess it would be, I guess the probably that answer, Jeff, if I can give it some interpretation, would be, you know, whatever you find, put it in some perspective with some expertise that says, okay, we found X, Y, and Z, um, and based on that, we feel that, you know, this is where we found it. You know, are you only finding it in the stream channel? Are you finding it outside the stream channel? Or you're not finding anything. Mm -hmm. 
and then you know what's the biology of that fish you know if you're finding something that's just a maybe more of a I can't imagine you find any cold water fish out there but if you did you know is it something that's really going to likely stay in the stream or is it something that's you know going to kind of explore mm -hmm. more I can think of a kind of a similar review it was probably about 10 years ago try and dig through it forward it to you guys so you can just look because that one got negated because of fish okay so let me let me see what I can dig up which one was that Don that was um, Pines North, no North up around Venturco's lot. Oh, yeah. That, that one with the long driveway. Oh, when he wanted the access coming in farther so, down Lumber Street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. okay. it was a finger of wetland coming up through there. Right. It was an intimate stream way down. And um, he, they showed, you know, that there was fish making right. it all the way up. Yeah, so okay. So negated that. That was, that had to be 15 years ago, I would say. We're aging ourselves. Yeah, that was a while ago. <laughs> okay, so hopefully that gives you... Some good feedback. Um, so yeah, that should be good. Uh, assuming everyone's uh, amenable to that strategy. Mm -hmm. good. Uh, and then um, continuation date. Uh, probably shouldn't should be fine for the next hearing. August sixth. Yeah. So two I'm sorry, weeks. To the next one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, Thank you. Ready, Don? Yeah. So Garland, 3 Whitman Lane. This is a waiver request for condition 17A. Good evening, Mr. Garland. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, so uh, I asked Don for uh, your approval to get relief from the uh, surveyor requirement or the uh, an engineer as built on on this uh, sign off of the certificate of compliance okay uh, 17a I think it is so uh, my wife and I bought that property new through Hallmark back in 1998 and had no idea <laughs> that there was an order of conditions on it lived there for 21 years uh, and uh, went to sell it, uh, and it was only like two days before the closing that the closing attorney came up. came up and said, "There's an outstanding order of conditions." And we're like, "What?" <laughs> okay. Uh, so maybe for one attorney in Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and boo for the one that le two. let us buy it uh, and didn't tell us that there was an outstanding order of conditions because we would have sure told Ron Rue and Ed Tarka. That's part of their responsibility right? Uh, when they sold us the house. Uh, so uh, thankfully, the, the buyers uh, said, you know, we understand. This is not something you uh, are springing on us. It's as much a surprise to you. Uh, they let the sale go through. Uh, and I said I would do my best to, to get it signed off. OK. Uh, so came in to Don and uh, got the documents to find out what uh, what was required uh, and Don had someone come out and look at it uh, and he gave me a, a write-up on what they found which was the uh, the signage needed to be put in place and needed a uh, engineer as built uh, on it so uh, I put the signs in place about them from Ryan Gassett <laughs> okay uh, and I put them along the line of the uh, is it laser pointer for you? Yeah, okay. Along the uh, tree line there? Yeah, along the, it was along the property line here. Uh, and I recall, I remember this uh, sediment barrier. 
because I had to dig it up. <laughs> you know, that was something else I should have made them do, but it was still there when we moved in. So, I mean, I, I knew where it was, uh, and it, the, the property slopes off right at that spot where the house is, uh, on the edge of the house there. Uh, so, uh, that was the erosion barrier bef during the construction. It's long gone. Uh, but you know, I knew where it was, uh, and so what I did was I took. They did do an as-built, but it didn't contain. And, and this is the as-built they did. So this is the house, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I copied in from the uh, the conservation commission plan. So I overlaid the property. Uh, map and it's very clear you know where this is okay uh, so I just I traced that on there uh, here and then I put the signs up I put five signs up so those, that's the location of the signs yes okay. uh, and there's dense vegetation all along here okay uh, I have a picture of it if you'd like to see it uh, you can barely see the signs back in there on top of four foot high post so there's there's been no disturbance in this area okay uh, so those are in place uh, and so I, since this was the as-built for the house and the septic and, and all that, I added on the, we did build a, a two-car garage. Uh, really, as soon as the house, we bought the house, we realized we didn't have enough room, so we added this two-car garage. Uh, and I, I took my own laser and, and did the measurements from the, from the known uh, locations on the as-built plan uh, over here and made sure that everything was in exactly the right spot. So okay. the, the as-built is you know, 90 plus percent or 95 percent uh, and I added these couple of items uh, with the aid of an architect's, you know, an engineer scale yeah. on the plan and then just transferred those in the field. And okay. So all right. I'd like to save a few thousand dollars. <laughs> no, I understand. Yeah. Um, and, uh, all right. So those were the kind of the key things. Don was the um, the signage, the garage, right, and um, the footprint of the house was okay, as I recollect. Yeah. And then it was the you know getting it signed off as an. Uh, by an engineer, which I think, you know, right. given the, uh, the work that you did on this and the measurements, I think I'm okay with letting that go in this case, since uh, it Thank wasn't you. really, at, you know, your fault, it was the, the builder. So uh, I think we should be good to go. Does that sound okay with everyone? Yep. Sure. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. It's just a wee request, so we don't need to vote on it. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Mr. Gollin. Thank you, sir. Happy trails. Were you moving to Florida? Or? No, we uh, we built the house over on the lake. Oh. We were before you guys five years ago on that. Okay. Very nice. So Thank you. we're, but we finally sold this one. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Move from one side of town to the other. <laughs> About as far as you can go from <laughs> in Hopkinton. You'd still be in Hopkinton. Okay. REC Hopkinton Chamberlain Whalen subdivision. This is an informal discussion. Hello. Good evening. So, Kathy Sherry for REC Hopkinton. So, we asked to come before the commission in regards to the Chamberlain Whalen subdivision as we're starting the planning for the individual house lots mm -hmm. and wanted some initial feedback and direction on the preliminary plan. Um, just as an update, we've actually entered into an agreement with Toll Brothers. Um, we will complete the road and infrastructure, and Toll Brothers is going to develop the individual house lots. So, uh, a quick point, I'm going to turn it over to Sean and Scott, and they can introduce themselves, and then they'll go through the preliminary plan with you. Okay. Um, because it just has been a little while since we've been in front of the commission with this particular subdivision, just a quick recap. Um, so it's about a 103-acre parcel. 45 acres are being um, preserved as open space. The remainder of the acreage has been approved for 32 house lots, as well as the road and the infrastructure to support those house lots. 
So we have the infrastructure, the road is in progress right now. Um, we are still waiting on a couple of permits in relation to the wetland crossings and in parallel with that we're starting the individual house lot. Kind of. So with that I'll turn it over to Sean and Scott. You can introduce yourselves and go through the point. Oh. Good evening. Hi, Sean Knuckles with Toll Brothers, Scott Maselli with Toll Brothers. Um, we have an overall plan for you here. This is uh, Whalen and Chamberlain, and then the detail uh, of each of the intersections here. So what, what we've put together is, is a preliminary house layout with potential options shaded in here. Uh, the 50-foot, we were able to respect the 50-foot buffer everywhere with uh, no disturbance. Uh, the 100-foot is in red, uh, and that's where a significant number of these lots, uh, due to the front setback or you know the constrained nature of these lots, the uh, structures are within the 100-foot buffer. Uh, actually, 19 of the 32 are within the 100-foot buffer. Um, and a good number of them are deep enough into that buffer that would likely require tree clearing right up to the 50-foot buffer line. Um, so we were hoping to get some initial feedback from the commission. We have individual smaller sheets also if, if you wanted. So just uh, uh, so I met with these guys informally, um, kind of gave them my feedback, but I wanted to just open it up to the rest of the commission um, so that they can kind of get a sense of, um, you know, what the other commission members feel about this and, um, you know, whether it's something that, uh, you know, you would consider, um, that you wouldn't consider, whether you would want changes to it, um, whatever. So I'll just um, I'll open, it up, open it up to you folks and you can kind of give them some preliminary feedback based on, you know, your views of this. So uh, also, we do still need to do some, the, the septics are all size based on preliminary test data that was performed. So on some of these ginormous septic systems, we do hope to potentially get some better park data where uh, hopefully those could get a little smaller. Um, but with the 60 foot septic line, there, there aren't that many lots that if the septic gets smaller, the house is able to pull out of the wetlands more or wetland buffer more. Yeah, the 60 foot setback line actually ends up containing a lot of the septic area on a lot of these lots. And it's not really the setback line that's pushing the house back. It's, you know, we're really pulling these, you know, really touching the setbacks line in many cases. And just going back to a comment that you guys made when we had met, this is kind of your um, worst case scenario home model that you're looking at. And depending on what the buyer wants, it can be pulled back or scaled back. Or is that correct? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say worst case scenario, but largest home that we would be able to build on the lot, I guess maybe that would be considered a worst case scenario yeah. in yours. But yes, the, the largest home that would fit on that lot, okay. um, we would, our intention would be to come before the board and have everything uh, pre-approved by you before we would open up to, for any sales of the home and make sure that we understood the limits that we were able to build within and clear within. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Can you chair? Yes. So, as you just heard, we've been having an issue with builders coming in and doing the house by house and the permit and PIB, whatever the right word is, um, wasn't installed because they wait till the very end. And by that time, the first person that moved in already, you know, cleared out half the wetland. So, 
what do you guys propose for that? Because, I mean, you see some of these houses are, like, right up against where, so in, you know, in, it's Long Creek waiting for happen. So how are you going to prevent that? In terms of uh, delineating the 50-foot buffer or, or... Or providing a permanent... Barrier. Permanent barrier. barrier wherever it. it will be determined. But would that be, like... Right. Do uh, you find that, like, if it's consistently, like, one, like, it, yep. like a fence or something that... Like looks a consistent. Wood, like a wood split Boulders. rail fence. Or whatever. Or the, you know, so it looks very consistent yeah. throughout the I'm development. I'm not sure. Do we so. have a lot of rock on the But also site? Mark, or, too. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, yeah, we would, we would put that together. I think we would prefer something like a split rail fence, but if there were boulders that could be utilized on the site, we, we would definitely be willing to use some boulders to, to delineate that buffer line. Uh, to, and stop that yard creep from occurring because um, yeah some of these are, are really tight yeah like, they're, like they're, the first thing they're going to do is look at it and say well, how much can I clear to put in my kids place at mm -hmm. right. or pool you're right <laughs> right on top of the septic system um, what's the sequence like is it just whatever lot they want or are you going to build from one end to another um, we haven't determined that yet. We would hope to be able to open uh, both sections at the same time, de depending on their completion, uh, and but and then just control all the disturbance or control everything lot by lot. Mm. Do you have one more question? Yes. <laughs> so um, the other thing I see these little like blue areas. I'm assuming that's stormwater retention areas. Correct. I'm noticing that they're crossing over property lines. So what's the, like, how would you there, ensure that they're maintained? So there would be a homeowners association within this community that manage all the stormwater basins. That was a requirement. That was a requirement and is a permit. condition of our approval. What else is the homeowners association going to do? Probably, you know, there might be an entry monument or, or something like that, but it would be a de minimis homeowners association. Yeah, so like 10 years from now, those things aren't going to get maintained. They really won't um, after the last person moves in. Um, well, ours, so those would just have will. to be very clear. We, we oh, see, look at you. So oh. positive. It's encouraging. <laughs> well, we, we do everything we can to set them up right. I, I know that. And we hire the right companies. And, and yes, in 10 years, we don't have a whole lot of control if the homeowners decide not to maintain them. But yeah. we, we do everything right to set them up initially and fund them properly and make sure they're collecting the right dues. Um, maintaining stormwater basins is not a very expensive thing to do for 32 homes you know it may cost you know three or four hundred dollars per home per year that is a very manageable fee that should be able to ensure that these basins are maintained yeah and my concern really is looking at it is that's very valuable backyard space that somebody's <laughs> going to want to fill in very quickly and they're not going to realize that that depression is the stormwater basin that services a regional area so I think it just have to, I don't know. I don't know, you know, we haven't figured out the way to prevent it, but Eastman's demarcation, all that good Yeah, stuff. I think the yeah. stormwater basins are pretty clearly defined with the the, the change in depth and, and there's berms around them that no one's going to. They, they definitely would try to encroach in the wetlands or in, into the buffer zone before they would try to uh, go into a, a wetland or a, a stormwater basin, I think. This one's shaped perfectly for a gunite pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there's some very challenging ones where, you know, it it would be... Uh, well, you mean like this cul-de-sac one here? You know, it, it would or be... It? This one here where actually the 100-foot the wetland setback and the 60-foot um, front setback line are on top of each other. So when you look at that lot, there's actually no way that you could not build in the in the hundred foot buffer. It's, it's an unbuildable lot without being able to go into the hundred foot buffer on that lot. And it's, you know, there's multiple that are like that. Mm -hmm. Well, to the chair, I mean, I think that was a concern when we first did this, and we said we probably, you know, maybe you want to look at less lots. So I don't know what you said, but I wouldn't be inclined to approve any of those because those are self-imposed. Right. 
you wouldn't be inclined to approve. To approve a house oh, so that has so much in the hundred, an entire in the hundred, um, because you did, you know, you guys determine the lot sizes, not you, but whoever, you know, as it was developed, like we didn't say you have to put it on that lot. These lots have to so go wherever. I mean, you're. We got like one over here, one over there. Those approved, are, so we've reviewed and approved the roadway and the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, not any individual house lots, nor all the house lots. You know what I mean? Which Understood. Is, that's why we're here. So your your no disturbance and your no build zone is 50 feet. Is that correct? But you wouldn't approve a, a house within the hundred at all. It doesn't. The houses that are entirely within. The, I mean, almost all of the development is within the jurisdictional area, so it doesn't seem to be consistent with the intent of the bylaw. Yeah, I mean, a lawn or a deck is one thing, but almost a whole house. In the, right. The buffer zone is another. And there's no hardship, there's no previous disturbance, so it's really hard to say, go ahead and clear a pre non, you know, an area that's never been disturbed before to build a really big house because you have to have a really big septic system. It's yeah, so just hard sell. So yeah, I, I think to my point that I made to you guys was, you know, we can work with you if there's a portion of the structure, you know, in the 100 foot buffer zone. Um, because of some of the mitigation that's been offered in terms of the open space and, and those types of things. Uh, but, you know, I think my sense is, is that when this was originally approved um, as a subdivision, it wasn't envisioned that there are going to be 5,000 square foot houses with three car garages put in here. Okay. Um, I think, you know, I kind of envision, you know, more modest size homes. Um, and I think that, you know, in the lots where there's no incursion in the buffer zone, the larger houses are fine. But in the lots where, you know, the entire house is in the buffer zone, and, and by the way, I'm glad to see that you pulled the yard, the proposed yards out of the 50 foot, because um, that was kind of a, you know, that was something that wouldn't be permitted. Um, but I think on the lots where, you know, the majority of the lot is in the buffer zone, you know, you just have to think of something smaller scale, you know. So, uh, like, lots seven and eight. Mm-hmm. Like, there, there's, no, there's no smaller scale house that fits on those lots and is not in that buffer zone. Lot 27. There, there's literally, there are, I counted. There are 13 lots that are unbuildable if they can't be in in the 100 foot buffer zone. Well, as I said, you know, we can work with you having part of the structure in the buffer zone. Um, but I mean, like lot six and seven, what size homes seven, are those? Seven, seven, seven or seven and eight. I mean, as the footprint, you know, for the house there, what, what you know. Just give me a rough idea. Of That's probably a three thousand square foot house. Okay. Three thousand square foot footprint. Yes. Well, no. No. Home. Oh, two stories. Yeah. And two car garage or three car garage? Uh, that's drawn as a two car. Uh, if you look at uh, lot seventeen, eighteen, those are probably closer to forty-five hundred. Uh, 5,000 square foot houses, potential um, with three car garages where there is no, there is room to, to work you know, the larger houses here and the smaller houses here. Like why is this septic system so much bigger than this one here? That, that's based on the, the test. preliminary yeah. park test. Some, some really slow part tests. But that being said, here's the front setback. The septic system isn't driving it. The front setback is driving a lot of these. Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's informal, so. So, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. To, to yeah. the chair. Uh, another thing is, 
you know, we tend to look at is the placement of the driveway, because these are going to be these big pull-in around the side driveways, most of them are proposed. And so, like this one, number 29, um, you know, if you flip the footprint or something, you know, you get the septic system, but not just the building, you've got a significant amount of impervious area that's going to be in the buffer. And because it's and side loaded? Yeah. As opposed because to it, be front loaded? Just because of the, yeah, because of the way that the, the driveways are designed. So we do typically also look at like different ways, not just the, you know, so we don't just look at the structures, we also look at any yeah. kind of disturbance, okay. of permanent impervious Yeah, flip, flipping that house makes sense. Yeah, like there's a couple like that. Yeah. You know, I guess what we really need to understand is if you look at lot 21, or, or, you know, on the corner here. Are you saying that's not an approvable lot? Yeah. Not in my opinion. It's a hard sell. Mm -hmm. And uh, so lot one, where well, there's no house on there, that's the same thing. Mm -hmm. And... Can we do community wastewater treatment plants around here? Package plants for the whole community? And the not, not, for a, not for a 30-lot subdivision. No, huh? Yeah, fantastic. you need to be north of a, you know. 66 is basically a community system that makes sense financially. Is there sewer up on Trainbull? And the, the other option that you guys have is you can go before zoning and request uh, waiver on the setbacks and get those, you know, changed too. That's an option. Um, we, we, I know the setback seems to be, yeah, except for the it, side lot. I think if, if we find that the, the septic systems can get smaller, that definitely makes sense. Mm -hmm. with, you know, if the septic system isn't pushing the house back. But then some of the side lot setbacks might be able to help you move it around, mm -hmm. right? Okay, like this, what is this, 16? But to, you know, the point with the septics, this, you know, in terms of, you know, topography and groundwater, you know, depth at the site, this was a very challenging site from the get-go. You know, there's high groundwater in a lot of areas. Um, there's very bony material out there. There's, like, a lot of boulders and cobbles. Um, so I can see why, you know, that you're probably not getting the ideal perks that you would like to get. Um, but, you know, that's that's a challenge of the site conditions. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have a question. It's kind of coincidental, but it just I happen to be going through paperwork. And in February, DEP wrote to REC with a list of stuff, and I haven't seen any kind of response or any anything further to that has anything come of that it's my understanding you have a copy of the revised plan that was submitted by Goddard um, we have resubmitted to DEP and Army Corps so and we're now fully compliant and have addressed the issues that were identified so they, they never wrote another letter that it's in progress we're waiting for okay. the response <laughs> the last round was in mid-june we submitted it yep. so and that was a uh, redesign that was one of the crossings on Whalen Road. And was that also, was the revised plan submitted to conservation? Yep. Scott had told me about it. Should have been CC'd on that email um, that went out to uh, uh, Christine. Uh, Christine. What date was that? Uh, I, I think it was like June 17th, June 19th. Because we came from Garden. Hit or miss by getting your emails. <laughs> that said, it was not um, at this point intended to be a formal submission to the Conservation Commission, and we have fully intend to, once we have our water quality cert, um, propose everything to the Commission um, and bring it forward for their approval. Um, okay. To the chair? Yep. Uh, what about MEPA process? Because I remember at some point there was, I think, work had started, and MEPA was advised of that, and MEPA had said you shouldn't be starting until MEPA is fully finished. We're not doing any work in the conservation areas at all. So all the work we're doing with the road. Is the MEPA is process complete? Do you have your final certificate? No. Do we, Tom? MEPA. That's not the water quality. MEPA is MEPA satisfied. We have, we're yes. waiting on water quality yep. and water Army Corps. Water quality is in. And Army Corps yes. is just waiting on yeah. water quality. So once so we have water quality is, or Army Corps is sitting waiting to issue 
for their permit and are simply just waiting for water quality to issue. Um, so you have your meat per certificate? Yes. Okay, any final comments? I don't want to drag this out too long. It's an informal. Uh, we still have some agenda items we got to address. Well. So I just want to be clear. Uh, the planning board approved all these lots, but and it, we're respecting the 50-foot notice there, but the, it's the commission of the opinion of the commission at the whole as a whole that these houses are some are unapprovable if the majority of the home is within the 100-foot buffer. If the majority of the home is going to be between the, the uh, 50 foot and the 100, you know, it's going to be a challenge. Yes. So, you know, you have the option of talking the zoning to see if you can get the setbacks changed, changing the orientation of the house, making the footprint smaller, you know, the septic potentially being smaller. I mean, those are all things that you would need to take a look at. Well, called out in the regulations, too. You might want to right. review the regulations because the, the buffer zone is discretionary. Mm -hmm. It's not by right. And typically, on large subdivisions, the commission has told the applicants they're typically looking for all structure outside the 100, and they're amenable to types of grading inside the, the 100. But obviously, every site's unique. And, um, right. Like they and said, They'll look at the mitigation that you're offering for buffer zone disturbance, and each one of those would represent an individual filing. Right. You know? And if we were able to put together an analysis of the disturbance o over the entire site uh, within the 100 as a percentage wise, is that. That would be part of the application. That yeah, that, that, yeah, that would be required. Okay. And just, you know, um, as an aside, you know, we look at these developments cumulatively, so that includes not only the house lots, but the roadway that was put in <coughs> and the disturbance associated, associated with the roadway and the infrastructure. And, um, and all and, the other developments. And, and all the other, right, all the other developments that are in this area on the, that are on the same ownership. Um, and, you know, the commission is, I think, um, Kathy would agree, you know, we did make some fairly considerable concessions, um, you know, uh, as part of the approval of the roadway, you know, and the infrastructure process as well. So I just don't want you to think that, you know, we're just looking at the house um, footprints and disturbance, you know, because we have to look at everything cumulatively. So that's, you know, that's factored into the decision making process. Understood. Okay. Thank I you, gentlemen. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> it's in, if it's on the 30 so, seconds. Okay, Orlando 5 Pine Tree Road. This is a project change request. Hello there. Good evening. How are you Mr. doing? Mr. Gassett, good. How are you tonight? Nice to see you. Good okay. to see you too. I'm Brian Gassett. I was hired by uh, the Orlandos to uh, construct their new home. Um, this has already been a approved plan by the uh, board and there's one area on the plan where they had a limit of lawn mm -hmm. here. Uh, all I'm asking is, if possible, 
uh, I just want to grade from this exist the new driveway area and just this has all been this was pre-disturbed from the previous homeowner so this is where the erosion control is now mm -hmm. and they're going to replicate these shrubs in this area okay. I just want to go from four feet here I have 25 feet from the 75 to I just want to try to grade that so it just works better with the yard and then it'll be this will once not be a lawn it'll just be we're going to just spray it and let it grow back in so it's grading during the construction then it'll revert That's back all. to just temporary disturbance temporary yeah disturbance. what the one thing that if possible i like to uh, squeeze a propane tank um, in between the 50 and the 75 it would be buried and i almost have the depth already because i'm higher with the grade for the house mm -hmm. um, my reason it. for that is eventually they're doing this pool area uh, behind the house and that's my only i have wells and electric over here that's my only real access to squeeze between the garage and the 75 and i don't want to have the tank too close to the equipment in the future so i just want to put the propane barrier tank here so i can run the lines right into the house straight and then this will still if i put it if i put it in here in. i can put it here it's just going to make it really tricky when we go to do the and you can't drive pool. over it i wouldn't want to <laughs> no it's a thousand gallon tank so it's like 14 feet long by four feet wide so you bury it and then that just turns into metal it, it, yeah it just has like a small trash barrel that sticks out of the ground about 16 inches to fill it that's it uh, I don't it'll just make this where the, where this turnaround is safer also if this is just a gradual and that'll all just come back natural yeah yeah that's fine. like i said all this originally was all pre-disturbed right there was an old building here if you remember there was, yeah okay there was a the, okay i think i'm all set with that Is everyone okay all right uh it's a project change request so if i can get a motion to approve it please for five pine tree lane i'll make a motion in a second second all in favor aye, aye. aye. and opposed all set Great. thank you very much you're welcome okay mass pinnock woods project change request Good evening. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Peter Barberi. Uh, I'm an attorney with uh, Fletcher Tilton on behalf of the applicant. With me is Dale McKinnon. Um, Bruce Wheeler was here but had to go to another meeting. So um, what we're talking about is a, kind of the out parcel of the Mass Monarch Woods uh, development uh, it has an old existing house. It's located at 5 West West Elm Street. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry I didn't print off enough of these, but hopefully there's only one short. That's a summary, and, and I'll give out plans. These are the same thing. I think there's seven of these. Um, what we did was we took the existing condition uh, and highlighted uh, the air the resource areas in the existing development so right now historically there's been an old house on the property that you'll see on the plan is, is depicted in red that's located both within uh, the 50 foot buffer on the wetland to what's called the left hand side of the property uh, and then also within the, the 125 foot vernal pool buffer The first sheet is this one here, it's kind of upside down. Again, the house is in red. Um, you can leave it that way. Um, West Elm Street at the top of the page. 
Uh, you can see the old remnants of a driveway, and the yellow line kind of depicts everything that's already disturbed. If you've been by the site, you can see it's basically all cleared. Uh, so the entire site is essentially cleared. The rest of the plans depict the, the 50 and the 100 foot buffer and the impacts upon those. Uh, and then I handed out a sheet, uh, and then these are the plans of what we're proposing to do or wanted to talk to the commission about doing, uh, which is pulling the house uh, out of the out of the 50 foot buffer on the le on the on the left hand side of the property. Uh, so again, this would be the new house. This is that 50 foot buffer. We pulled it entirely out. A little bit of sliver of a driveway that's still in the 50, uh, but there's no house and everything else. The, the house is still within the the uh, that 125 foot vernal pool but we're kind of cutting back on all the uh, impacts uh, and that's the summary sheet so with the proposed changes uh, we reduce the, the disturbance within in the last sheet I don't have it. The, yeah this is kind of the final plan we're talking about so the yellow slash areas would be the areas that we would restore and bring back more into a national condition so it's all around the perimeter and all within the buffers of the site. Uh, so ultimately, you look at the schedule, um, there's over 2,500 square feet of replicated or restored area within the vernal pool, uh, 125 foot. There's 1,080 square feet of restored area than what's out there now within the 50 to 100 foot buffer. Uh, within the 50-foot buffer, uh, we're restoring, or, or re yeah, restoring 5,500 square feet. And overall, the total resource area reduction by doing this yellow is that we're uh, reducing 9,100 square feet of kind of existing disturbed area within all the resource areas. So overall, we think it's a better plan to do, uh, and it provides greater protection to all the resource areas, wetlands is on the left and vernal pool on the right. So from the viewpoint of the replication areas, which is all this area in yellow, um, you know, we didn't have any great designs, maybe some wildlife mix, whatever the commission would, would want to see uh, within that, uh, re not replicated, but restored area. Uh, we could do some plantings, we wildfire mix, whatever, whatever the commission deemed appropriate. The chair, can you just yes. So, I'm just trying to remember. I think so. This particular um, uh, perm number one, it's from the entire Maskinac Woods, right? The perm, like the the perm, your, the project change request. The permit was for the entire thing. Well, we were just looking at this one site. The rest of the site is off and done. We but should is it be a separate permit? Was it it's all under the same permit. That's why you're asking for Yeah. Permission. But these numbers you're giving us are not for the entire the, permit. No, it's that's just, just for what we site. classified as kind of this lot. Again, this lot, I wasn't involved with the original approval of the project. The yeah. original approval of one I see had, a, had the access coming through here. And, and then I don't know whether it result of the Consummation Commission looking at it, the Planning Board looking at it, but ultimately the access to the other 30 lots came off of West Elm as you come around the corner, which left this lot kind of on its own. However, nobody separated it from that development. So it's still part of the overall development, but what we're talking about tonight is kind of what we consider to be its own little lot. Right. So I think under the original permit, right. um, we got the subdivision plans up. This was- Right, so you can see on those- This was permitted to be restored, the structure. 31 raised. right not raised but right. renovated oh. that's yeah. that's what that's what's approved that's footprint yeah okay. that's the footprint that Thank was you. approved so again we weren't around with, with the original plan I think you're right the, the concept was to try to restore that but the house has become in, in just condition that it's not it's feasible in nature of restoring it and we think overall uh, that's what overall happened. redevelopment and restoring all the areas may we think is a better scenario yes, dear chair, I, this 
um, whatever you have schedule conditions with these numbers is a little misleading. I would like to see the entire permanent project because we would, you know, we did it all together because I don't know right now if the net gain or if. Since it's all done in the same notice of intent. Right, same notice of intent. That makes sense. It has to be aggregated. Yeah, yes, yes, that's the word, aggregated. There you go. Yeah, uh, so a couple points. Um, I think when you guys came before us in November, um, the direction was that this couldn't be approved as a project change request. You know, it need to be either an amended NOI or a new NOI. Um, so that's point yeah, number we wanted one. Yeah, if we could work out the details, then we'll follow whatever process you wanted to do. Yeah. Number two is, um, you know, I went out to the site and took a look at it. Um, over the weekend and in my opinion I think this entire area over here is growing in fine I don't think it really needs to be restored okay and I will defer that to Matt and Don if they want to go out and take a look at it but there seems to be plenty of birch white pine um, and shrubbage that's growing in there I didn't see any invasives I didn't do a thorough inspection but um, you know I'm just not really convinced that this area here needs to be restored um, off to the left is there uh, is there really any erosion control barriers all on that hole yeah that's still there <laughs> yeah this is what the site looked like back in um, 2013 yeah, that's still all in when the after the water line went in yeah. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes. I see an existing leaching area. I do not see any sign of any kind of septic system. Is this on the... That, I'm probably misclassified, but that's the existing septic system of the house, which we're right. working with the uh, Board of Health to retain for the new house. Okay. So it wouldn't be any needed any excavation or anything for that. You, you propose using the existing leaching field? Yes. yes. For the new house? Right. Good luck with that. So a new leaching system with the new house? No, they would use the no. existing leaching oh, field. The existing leaching right. system, okay. Existing leach field, new. Yeah, I, I think. A new tank in place. Yeah, I understand the situation that developers in here. Um, you know, but the house tends to kind of decay when the front door is left open for three years. That's my first comment. Uh, my second comment is this lot is almost entirely in the buffer zone, you know, be it the vernal pool buffer zone or the buffer zone to the wetland. And I understand that, you know, there is some previously disturbed areas. Um, you know, I go back to when this project was originally approved. Uh, the approval was predicated on, you know, this structure being renovated mm -hmm. and not a new structure being put on the lot that is the size and uh, the same size and the same look as the other buildings um, that were installed. You know, I know this is one entire development, but this is kind of a lot that's off from the main development mm -hmm. um you know my sense is and again back to this point you know and i'll defer to matt and don uh, but this area to me does not look like it needs to be restored i think that's fine as it is um so my sense is i you know i feel going back to what was originally proposed for the site um you know i'd be willing to approve something under a new filing not a project change request that mm -hmm. is more consistent with the footprint of this building that's here um, and you know even to have it pulled outside of the buffer zone a yep. little bit you know if you could pull it out a little bit you know maybe we could consider something that's a, a little larger than that than what's there because i know mm -hmm. it's a fairly small house yep um and uh I mean, those are, you know, kind of my takeaways from this. And 
you know, let the other com commission members weigh in. And I, and I know that developers in a difficult situation here because it's a small lot. There's not a lot you can do with it. But you know, we're also constrained with. Um, you know, we have to adhere to what this project was originally proposed mm -hmm. under and what was approved. And I just feel like coming back and proposing something that is not at the same scale um, and is significantly larger um, just sets a precedent that, um, you know, particularly since it's all in buffer zone for the most part, yeah. it just sets a precedent that, um, the, the, that we would have to do this in other situations. Yeah, that, you know? that's right. The, the only question I had, and again, I wasn't involved in that thing, I'm assuming that what I'm taking to be a trail on, on that's in the area that's coming back is, is supposed to be constructed. It, and that looks to, yeah, this that looks trail. to be right up against the wetlands, right? Right. I don't know whether, I mean, I think it probably makes sense to try to pull that a little bit away from that as well. It, if that made sense um, and I think that could be an improvement as well because it almost looks like it even hits a corner of a wetland area now that's not a precise scale plan but it looks to be probably awfully close to the edge of the wetland mm -hmm. so I don't remember the original plan but is that an old cart path or is that a proposed new trail I was it wasn't a around I, 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 it was I can't tell you but trail. it was because it was on no I don't know I yeah. yeah. Okay, so maybe it was an old historic thing that was to come out anyways. Or just abandoned. Yeah. Yeah. It's labeled okay. as a proposed trail, but I don't recall anything beyond this that. Being so we'll take that off the plan to begin so, with. I don't, I, I don't see how anybody would ever put a proposed trail Through in the, the wetland. wetland. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. That didn't make any sense to me. And I said, no. if that's what was approved, maybe it made sense to pull oh. it away. So maybe that, you're right, maybe that was just the old historical. Um, yeah, so. So we'll take that off the plan no matter what. Yeah, so that's kind of the, and again, if anyone else has any comments, that's kind of the feedback. Yeah, the yeah. Um, you know, we again we can't do it as a project change request, so it's going to be, you know, another. Yeah, because see, that's really that's the plan I saw, and it looks like it connects up to the trail as part of the development. Yeah, but it's not labeled. Right. Whereas, I just remember proposed trail up on this site, not right. down there. That says proposed trail, but we'd have to look at the old filing. This yeah. is a plan from the current. From, well, there's one right there, Don. Scroll down just a little bit, uh, or up, sorry. See that little branch coming off the trail right. going from top to bottom? It kind of goes off and down. So you're talking right up through here, right? No. no. Mm -hmm. Right here. Right, that's what I mean. Yeah. So but that's what I'm getting at. That, that, that wasn't. Is, that, that's not we're labeled. We're wondering if that was a proposal that didn't get approved. Right. Right. No. Somebody's so idea of to do something. Trail. That has no language. Uh, we'll we'll double yeah. check the original approved yeah. plan. I, I don't recall. And it's but beyond this the PID. But it, it, and if it is on it, it seems to make sense to pull that a little bit away. Um, and I don't it was know an old trail. It's grown over now. Yeah. This is. This Right. You can't walk through there, that's for sure. Right. right. Uh, okay, so hopefully that helps you out. All right, any other suggestions or anything? Is there, a, for the areas on the other side and the areas that we would propose restoration, is there anything in particular that the Commission would like to see as part of the restoration? They typically look from the viewpoint, even some trees that kind of create a delineation that you know you can't go beyond, you know? I think we would definitely want some sort of a PIB. In the living room of the house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, wherever it lands, but I mean, I, I think I would agree with Jeff that if this is all growing in, then it's not. It doesn't make sense to it, go in there and disturb it. No, and I don't think it makes sense to okay. necessarily count it in restoration. It's helpful to see, too, is, you know, there's a difference between existing and proposed disturbance, but how much uh, additional impervious 
versus what the current structure is. We'll, we'll get that number for you. The difference uh, is about, about 1,100 square feet less with the proposed. Is that curvious? Yes. Does that because, include? Of the, because of the driveway. Okay, I was going to say, does that include the driveway? But it's yeah. gravel. It's not, right. it's not asphalt. It's noted in the minutes. Right. So it's doing what identifies gravel driveways as pervious. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just look at it as, as a new impact. Okay. Go through the chair? Yes. I think if there were restoration or plantings or something, the buffer zone to the vernal pool may be of greater value than the buffer zone to the non pool mm -hmm. area. So if there's opportunities to do, you know, restoration that's going to improve that vernal pool yep. habitat, I think that may be of greater value than something on the other okay. side. Okay. I'll try and review. I remember the, there was questions about the, the vernal pool back in the, back in the day. One of the ones that was mm. kind of marginal. Mm -hmm. so. Right, yeah. Oh, and, it, and it was bifurcated by the roadway too. Right. right. Yeah. It was on the neighbor's property. Yeah. Okay. And then the other uh, request you had was the um, infiltration for the storm drains or the gutters on the houses. Yep. It's part a, of the major development. That was a standard development. condition that they want it waived, and that's just that's a standard condition we required on every development. Yep. So we're not inclined to waive that. You can just. Yeah, they're that. trying to get everything in together. The, the plan from the viewpoint of the major development is, is probably to do all the landscaping and all that stuff probably starting in September. Okay. At which point in time we'll put together the, all the as plans, which will delineate, you know, the roof runoffs in, in the whole drainage system. Okay. That sounds okay. good. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Valise, 76 Pine Island Road. I sent that email out. Um, he, uh, he wrote to me um, uh, yesterday saying uh, he wasn't able to attend and was hoping to get a continuation. Okay. So basically it was, um, there was um, some site activity. I, I was called out to, to look at some exposed soils that might be washed in the lake and, and they were gonna um, stabilize those areas. Then I noted that there was some work that occurred without a permit, you know, some uh, docks and shed work. Uh, the commission might be able to look at it, especially, you know, maybe um, as after the after the fact applications. But if you want to hold off and review it when the when the homeowner can come in and present his information. Yeah, let's do that. I think that makes sense. So I'll table that out. And then Pulte Homes Legacy Farms North extension permit for the order of conditions. I reached out to them and um, asked them to provide. Typically, we in a request they tell us um, how much work they performed to date and, and how much work is left under the um, request. I never heard back from them. I thought they would come and um, provide that information verbally. So when does it expire, Don? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I mean they've got it. They've got it um, ahead of time. Okay. So. Um, yeah. The other the other thing that I would like to condition that um, <coughs> extension on is that they um, reimburse the uh, residents at Three Wind Song on Legacy Farm South for the fence that they had to relocate. You can uh, try and take an, an another application and. Yeah, it's this whole day. They're both, you know. So. All right, so you, you want me to say um, that um, you'd like them to come into the next meeting and, yep. Yeah, we cool. I can tell them I don't have a problem with that. I don't think it's fair that the homeowner has to bear the mistake of, you know, a mistake that they made, right. even though they were willing to. So. Okay. 23 Valleywood. Yeah, this is one where it's not a, um, you're not, you don't have your wetland hats on, you have your property manager hats on. Mm -hmm. And um, the applicant uh, abuts uh, the town forest. 
Oh, he yeah. wanted to trim some trees. Yeah, there yeah. was. Uh, remove or trim? Or remove. Oh, remove, right. Yeah, yeah, one tree to remove. Yeah. On our pro on town property. On Concom. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Regulated property. Right. So I went out, I thought I had the. Here. I thought I had the as built plan in here. I could have sworn I, I threw it in. But basically, um, you can see this tree right here is the one that concerned with. And what we were doing was we, we, we had um, an existing as built plan that, that showed um, the foundation and the well. So we pretended to be surveys. We just ran a tape off the uh, corner of the house. Oh, yeah. And 32 foot would have basically split the tree. So it looked like at one point the previous homeowner took out his half of the tree on his <laughs> land. And, and then left the, the other Yeah, half. and then the other half is still there. You know, and now we're getting some rot in here, and they've they've got some con concerns because basically it it does come uh, it comes over, it grows through, and it's yeah. the up is reaching over for the light. So um, and then there was one tree um, here that is sending branches out, you know, over from your property onto their property. So they're hoping it just pruned some of the branches on the tree that's totally in the in the uh, in the townland, and then they were hoping to remove this one um this okay. half that's on you know yeah i'm fine with that Is everyone okay with that seems pretty reasonable. i would like to get a tree warden which i don't think we have at this point oh yeah and that was so when i was opinion. talking to him i was like i was like okay it's it's the town's tree and uh i go we don't the commission doesn't have a budget for for stewardship on stuff like this i'd have to run through the, the town manager's office to see if there's, you know, I, I was like, rainy day money, I, I, oh, you I, want I, I don't know. Pay no, oh. no, and then when I was talking about that, I was just talking from a neighborly standpoint, it's our tree, how do you want it, and he goes, no, he goes, I, I would propose to take it on his dime, to take the tree down and to prune the branches so he wouldn't charge the town okay. to do that. So I said, okay, I'll pass that along. Yeah, I think that's fine. So how about a bonus question on this one? So is that land? Does this owner just happen to know that that's town owned land, or is it? The yeah, he knew. Well, it, he land? knew. He knew, but uh, he didn't. He thought this was all town land. This is actually private property through here, and his, he's got a crazy. Oh, so he's, kind of he's got a crazy. But the trees he was concerned with are the ones behind his house. So is it? So is the is the town land marked, or is he just happens to know because he's? Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry. Let me. Uh, I'm just curious because that was, you know, that's yeah, I mean, because he reached out to me and I pulled up um, some old records. And um, but if you go out in the backyard and look, there's nothing saying, there's nothing that indicates to someone that it's town owned property, right? Correct. Okay. All right. Doesn't so, no, not really. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm uh, telling you. <laughs> but basically, uh, I'm sorry, I, I could have sworn I, I um, downloaded the. Um, yeah, no, I'm just curious because that's something that obviously has been coming up a lot. Because we basically up a lot lately. we were able to pull because we had an old old file because there were wetlands on the on the site, but it was to the front, so the trees here in the back yard are outside the commission jurisdiction. So it was like an old file um, um, five five. Uh, I should be able to get to it. Um, that's okay, Don. Sorry. I think right. we, I think okay. we're good. So right. just a question on this. Um, so there's no there's no trails or anything near this tree, right? Oh no. Looks like way. So do you guys want that tree removed or would you prefer to see it cut and dropped onto the town property? Oh that's and, a, oh, and the wow. reason I ask is for a carbon sequestration right. concern. Because what's gonna happen if this tree is cut and taken by a tree cutting, they're either gonna chip it or they're gonna no, cut yeah. firewood. I it it in Typically, and I'm trying to now. I'm trying to remember if I if I talk to this guy. But basically, I mean, that's what we would always say. If they can if they can take it if they can take it down without damaging other trees, and lay it. Yeah, down. and then we would just leave the wood on the town's land. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So environmentally speaking, that's much more beneficial, right. both from yeah. wildlife and for a carbon perspective. Well, well, so normally, that's what. So I usually would talk with the down. with the tree guys to because obviously the three things we're always focused on is the safety of the the property owner safety of the guys doing the work and trying to do it in as an environmentally friendly manner as possible. So those are those are the typical the things, you know, it's like, oh, can we just, you know, high ho timber and drop it, you know, without hitting anything? If we can't do that, can can you lower it? And then it's sometimes when they're up there, like, 
well, lowering it sometimes is, is more dangerous. You know, if we're just going to take a crane and we're going to pull it over here and drop it down, you know? So it's a lot of times I'm trying to weigh, balance weigh those, the, uh, weigh, uh, weigh all those things. options. Yeah, you know, so um, that would be something I would, I would want to talk to the tree guy. Uh, I mean, it's theoretically, it would be cheaper for the homeowner, too. If you can just cut it and let it fall, exactly. that's a heck of a lot cheaper than having to cut right. it all up oh, yeah, and take it away. Right. Exactly. Yeah. A, yeah. a further option is to pollard it and leave the trunk standing where it becomes a haven for bugs and then... And that's what I bugs. talked about, that's too, you know. Um, hmm? That's a good option. Well, the best option is well, you to just, leave the you're taking out the, the, the dangerous that's part they're right. concerned about is the, you know, is the, is the top 50 foot, you know, but if it's, if it's just a... Um, you know, a, a woodpecker pole, you know, that's leaning yeah, out. But, but that know? someday just becomes some scraggly 50 foot tree with 85 suckers growing out of it that get to be the same height eventually. Well, talk right. to them and see what they're amenable, Tom. We'll right, uh, right. Don, we'll defer to your okay. expertise on that. All right. Um, okay, disclosure of appearance of fever or influence, item 12. That was, um, uh, we've had a few of these um, yeah. from Lucas. They're, um, this was from Borrego. Right. And yeah. no, noting that, you know, they're not going to be working with the applicant in Hawkington. Okay. Good. Hopefully you saw by my memo. I didn't necessarily yep. <laughs> pull any punches. <laughs> no. You weren't holding back, that's <laughs> no. for sure. Okay. Zero Lumber Street. Let's table this to the next uh, meeting. It's getting late. Oh, are they, are they Do you want me to want me to just at least write them a letter saying we've um, received your um, your uh, letter and uh, you know we're taking it under advisement. Yada yada. Yeah, yeah. Right. You can do that. Just send them an email. Yep. Okay. I don't know if I got his email. Uh, I'll look to see what his letter. I'll, is. I'll actually reach out to um, Halt and see if they'd be interested in taking stewardship of that. Okay. Yeah, where's the us? You know. Where's the, where's the All right. I mean, I think it's a landlocked parcel, anyways, right? Oh, it, I know. Well, it, it actually abuts. Um, yeah, you, oh, the you get property. Yeah, and if you get street <coughs> access, oh, it abuts our this property. Is small. It abuts currently town yeah, property. Right, right. right. It is yeah. landlocked now. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, okay. And the last item is the commission reorganization. Just wanted to give anyone the opportunity to chair. You're so willing. Uh -huh. Melissa, Carrie. I Harry. think you're doing great. <laughs> I know. Is it notice how we were all silent? <laughs> of course, the person, I, the, I, person, I, the person who's not here often gets appointed for these things. That's true. There's only <laughs> one. I nominate actually. Jeff, if that's appropriate, uh, to continue as our chair. Second. Was he asking to be relieved? No, I, I don't mind doing <laughs> that. that, was that but a I, call I, for help? <laughs> well, I just nominated. It could have been yeah, failed. I get it. Furthermore, I nominate our, our two co-vice chairs to continue mm -hmm. being. And I'll second chairs. that. Oh, and we're all in favor. Aye, aye, aye. All right. All right. And then um, for some of the um, for some of the boards. Um, yep. Uh, you guys would need to because right now there's an opening on the CPC. You guys would, and that's the one you guys appoint Whoa. to. You're not on it. Who, you, 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 your thing resigned, tomorrow? so the commission has what to. What happened? We have to reappoint you. The commission oh. has to reappoint. Oh, so when you. I sent that thing in has about to, volunteering or whatever it was, that was useless. Oh, it expired. You mean not? Yeah, it expired. Oh. But the way, all the other boards, the commission makes a recommendation to like either the planning board yeah. or, or or the uh, board of selectmen, select That's board. That's just us, though. Yeah, like the other ones, you guys just give a recommendation. Hey, we think you should appoint this person. <coughs> But on the CPC, the commission makes the appointment, so they should do it yeah. now. Because so are you willing to continue, Jim, on the CPC? Yes. Okay, so I make a motion to reappoint Jim to the CPC on behalf of the commission. I guess it's on Second. Me. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Thank you, Jim. You're, you're welcome. And then... Um, Starting up again, and I don't know how valid the the um, uh, the website is, but it's um, it's because it says like um, two year term for the for Zach, but I think 
it's not, right? Yeah, exactly. She was you know, the so it's updates, it was every year. So, so I think, yeah, think exactly. we're every year. So we're going to be hearing from them pretty soon, right? I, I, I would assume. They already started. Yeah, because I mean, basically, Ted's Ted's on the computer. It says he's going to expire at the end of August. He's so going to die at maybe. the end of August. <laughs> his appointment. You got to be appointment. Sorry, sorry. God yeah, God. his appointment is going to uh, expire at the We're end of August, <laughs> and then uh, some of the other ones. Uh, looked okay. It's, it mentioned Ed's was going to expire. Uh, your term in open space <laughs> would expire in November. All right, so we can table that till November. So I would think, yep. And let's table Ted's until he gets back. So exactly. He has a voice. So. And what about Upper Charles? Is that appointed similarly to these other ones, or is that? Yeah, that was. A, it said it was a three-year term, and That's it said Jim selecting. on the computer. It said you your term was good through June of twenty. So you're okay. good till next year. I, when I went on, when I did that form, I just applied for everything that I was already on, not knowing. No, no, yeah. No, that's fine. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much so. I played for tree work. <laughs> okay. If I can get a motion to adjourn. Make a motion. And a second. A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. Okay.